We have a very special uh, treat today. Uh, I'm going to invite Pastor Marlene up. She's uh, an extraordinary woman of God. So would you guys welcome her? She brings the word. No stranger to our house. And, and thank you all so much for the kind cards and, and everything. I just all of a sudden I opened up my Bible and there's like five cards in there. You guys like did it under the radar. So I appreciate you guys. I love you all very, very much. I'm grateful for you. I'm honored to be here. Pastor Marlene. So you might be saying, what is a woman doing preaching on Father's Day? This is an unconventional church, okay? We are not bound by the letter of the law. We, we, we honor the law, but we are in the spirit. And so there's a message that God has for the fathers in this house that I believe that needs to come from a woman. Because you need to know the value that you have. Not just because a spiritual dad is telling you, but a spiritual mom is telling you as well. You remember Timothy was ministered to by his mother and his grandmother. His father was a Greek. That's all it says about him. Didn't seem to be involved in his life or active in his life. So there's times how, and I'm not asking for a show of hands, but how many women are leading their households because their husband, like Timothy, Timothy's father, is not a believer or their husband is not active or not present even though he's in the family. And so hats off to ladies that have to do both jobs. And amen. And I salute the men of God in the house of God that care for the young people, the children who come from those difficult family situations and care for them well. Hats off to you, I salute you, amen. So the title of the message, I was going to do this title, and then I thought, it's too complicated. Synergize, synchronize, and symphonize. And I thought, they're not going to remember that one. So the power of oneness and harmony. The power of oneness and harmony. But I'll give you the definition of those words because it's really what it's about. If you have not read Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey, uh, he does not claim it to be a Christian book. Uh, I know that he's a man that um, honors God, but I, not of the faith that we're of. But his book is absolutely biblical in foundational principles. Habit six is all about synergizing. It's what happens when people with different strengths and skills work together to make a whole that is stronger and more productive than the sum parts of it. Creative cooperation. It's a teamwork, open-mindedness, and the adventure of finding new solutions to old problems. But it doesn't happen on its own. It's a process. And through that process, people bring all their personal experience and expertise to the table. Synchronize, oneness, to cause to go on, to move, to operate, to work at the same rate and exactly together. Symphonize, harmony to play a sound together harmoniously, to combine things in order to make something to play or sound together harmoniously. So this is what God is doing in the family and in the church in this hour. He is bringing together a synergy, a synchronization, and a symphony of men and women in the home and in the church and in the marketplace. It's amazing what God is doing right now. I'm interconnected with ministries not only in America but globally, and hearing what God is doing around the globe is phenomenal. And it's not impacting our culture, it's a subculture, it's a remnant what God is using right now to do incredible things, and we're a part of that. Together we can produce far better results than they could individually. Synergy lets us discover jointly things we are much less likely to discover by ourselves. It is the idea that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Plus one equals three or six, or 60, you name it, meaning there's no limit. Once you have harmony and oneness and you have that synergy, it goes beyond what just simple math can produce. I'll give you an example of that. Deuteronomy 32, verse, uh, excuse me, yeah, verse 32, chapter 32, verse 30. This is the power of synergy. And two put 10,000 to flight, Excuse me, one puts a thousand to flight. I conveniently erased that out of my iPad. One puts a thousand to flight, two can put 10,000 to flight. How does that work in math? Because when God is in it, it exponentially takes it to a whole nother level that's humanly impossible to do on our own. When God is in the mix, the enemy stands no chance. 
when there's harmony and oneness and unity in the body, in the home, in the body of Christ, there is nothing that that people group can't do. And if you remember the Tower of Babel, it explains it very well. The Bible says, because they had one voice and one mind and one mission, there was nothing impossible for them. And so that's what the enemy hates. That's why the warfare is so great against the uh, family and against the church because the devil does not want us to find out this harmonious, synchronized, um, uh, symphonized, and synergized place in the spirit. But we're finding it, and when we're discovering it, we're using it, and we're seeing God accomplish great and awesome things. When we're submitted to God and one another, we can accomplish far more together than alone. That's what 1 Peter 5, 5 says. All of you be submissive one to another. Be clothed in humility. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You can't come into oneness with someone unless you humble yourself. I know this from personal experience, um, living a personal life of understanding the synergy of what can happen in a family dynamic, ministering to people continuously who come for prayer, who come for counsel and deliverance because there's such brokenness because they did not come from a home that exemplified that type of life. They did not come from a place of understanding the power of it. They came from a place of brokenness. And when you see what brokenness does in someone's life, it re, it re uh, recreates the same brokenness that was in their family now in their family. And so they don't understand this power of synergy. They don't know how to, as the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People tell us, to use biblical principles to actually come together so that we're in a win-win situation. When you're with two people that have conflict and you explain to them that <clears throat> there is a part that you both play of truth and there is a part that you both play that needs to change. But the only one that knows the whole part is God. And when we come to God together, I actually have an overhead that's going to be put up. If you want to put it up now, you certainly can. But when we come together in God, we come to a, a place of agreement that cannot happen without him. It's a higher place of agreement than just deciding on the color of the wall or the color of the carpet. It's a higher place of agreement than just natural things. It's in the spirit realm, and that's where the power of God is released. The enemy wars against relationships to keep individuals isolated and insulated from each other. Proverbs 18.1 says, A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire, and he rages against all wise judgment. The power of oneness in harmony in marriage. So if we could have that uh, display that I had sent. It's a triangle. I'll wait till it comes up. But the synergy in marriage in Genesis 2, verse 18. And the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Now, I'm not wanting for ladies in the house to feel like, oh my gosh, I'm not married. I'm alone. It's not good. Listen. Jesus was not married. Paul said, if you have to get married, go ahead. But if you can stay single, it's a gift. Stay single. So this isn't meaning that you have to have a husband or a wife. This means God saw that Adam, Adam, when he created him, and in him was both male and female, before God separated the woman from Adam's side. So what he meant was there is nobody comparable to him. So I need to make him a helper, someone that will keep, uh, keep company with him and, and keep the fire going together. So this, oh, it's not up. Okay, so praise God. Give me the thumbs up when it's up there, and then I'll turn and explain it. <laughs> it's a triangle. It's up now. Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, so the, this is the marriage triangle. So if you've got a husband on this side, and he's arguing his point of view, and he's right, and then you get a wife on this side, she's arguing her point of view, and she thinks she's right. There is an impasse. You cannot come to a higher level of understanding if you're only on the level of flesh. And when the Bible says that you come together as one flesh, that's the level. But here's the thing is you come together in oneness in Christ. The closer the husband gets to Jesus, the closer the wife gets to Jesus, the closer they get to each other. Now, for you, those of you that are in a situation where you don't have a spouse and you feel alone in your journey with God, I have some good news for you. So am I. And guess what? God 
is your covering. God is your helper. God is your guide. God is your counselor. That doesn't mean that my husband doesn't love me or that he doesn't provide for us or that he's not a good man. He's not on the spiritual journey with me. And a lot of people wonder, they'll see me, you know, going on years now and they'll be like, you got a wedding ring on and I never see you with anybody. And I'm like, I can't explain it. I can't fix it. I just know that God is working in me and working in this family unit regardless. And it hasn't disqualified me from being obedient to the word of God. And that's what I have to say to women that are spiritually alone. Do not let the decisions and the choices that your spouse makes to either not grow with you or grow in a different direction apart from you in certain ways, um, keep that, keep you from growing in God into the fullness of all that God has for you. And to the singles, I say John 16, 32 says this, Indeed, the hour is coming, yet, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each one to his own, and will leave me alone. This is Jesus saying it. And yet, I am not alone, because the Father is with me. We have to have the mentality, a marriage doesn't make you complete. Christ makes you complete. When two people come to the altar to say, I do, if they're both broken people, they bring brokenness into the marriage. And I've counseled, I want to say hundreds, I don't know, over the 46 years of ministry that I've been in, I guess I could say hundreds, hundreds upon hundreds of people that said, you know what, I didn't know Christ when I got married. And I ended up marrying my father, who was an alcoholic. I ended up marrying my mother, who's a whiner and a complainer and depressed. How did I end up with a spouse just like a family member that I was trying to get away from? Because deep calls unto deep. Because whatever brokenness is in you is going to be attracted to somebody else's brokenness to fit that place in your life. But in, Now, that doesn't give us an excuse to get a divorce once we come to Christ. Paul addresses that. You can do a study on your own. And he, what he says is if there's an unbeliever, then stay with that unbeliever because they're sanctified through you and because of the children. But that doesn't mean that you have to submit to abuse or you have to submit to an addictive lifestyle that's causing you and your children a hardship or pain. There are legitimate biblical reasons for divorce. Um, but it's not God's desire that we divorce. But he understands that there are times that it will happen. And it actually says in the scripture that they were given a permit to divorce. But again, it's not just because you don't like it the way your eggs are cooked. There's, there's got to be a violation of some kind of natural law or physical law of protection and safety. So when we're joined together um, with Christ, we are never alone. So people that go around thinking, unless I can find a mate, I'm never going to be complete. That's a lie from hell. You are complete in Jesus Christ. And when you're on the journey of healing and wholeness and you're that, that wholeness in your soul, should God bring someone into your life that he confirms through two or three witnesses and that you feel in your heart it's a gift from God, and you come to the altar, if that person is not in the same spiritual journey as you, there's going to be a hardship on you. As a matter of fact, the Bible says don't be unequally yoked with someone that's an unbeliever. A lot of women will say, you know what, I think I can win them to Christ if I just get married. Well, good luck with that. Can't give you a promise from God on that one. But then there's others that say, you know what, I, they're not really spiritually walking with Christ, but I know that they're a believer, as long as they're a believer in Jesus. And you know, and someone said to me, well, when you do marriage counseling, do you upfront tell them you won't marry them if they're unequally yoked? And I say, nope. What I do is I give an opportunity all through marriage counseling to give them an opportunity to start the journey together in the same place together before the wedding. Now, if we get all the way through the marriage counseling and the person that they want to marry says, I flat out do not believe in Jesus Christ. I flat out am not going to support her if she goes to church and all of that stuff. I, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm not doing it. I look at him and say, go to the justice of the peace then because I can't marry you, not with a clear conscience because my conscience does not permit me to do so. Not because you can't get married. You certainly can. You have every right to choose whatever you want, whatever kind of life you want. Be free, but I can't officiate. And so I, I have not seen one single case where I've had to do that. The people, because we love them well and love them to life and walk them through, have come to a place of saying, why wouldn't I want Christ to be the center of my marriage? Why wouldn't I want? So I've seen God use it. 
But we have to be really careful that we're not becoming unequally yoked and thinking we're tricking God into being okay and winking at what we're doing because it's what we want. Because there is a hardship that comes when you are spiritually single. So a couple of excerpts I'm going to read. Um, the book that I just wrote should be at my house any day now. It's called Gain Understanding and Then We'll Talk. It's all about men and women coming together as one in the home, in the church, and for the kingdom of heaven. Men and women see, think, feel, and function very differently, intentionally designed by God to be different. That being true, how can two walk together unless they agree? Amos 3.3. This seemingly impossible concept doesn't mean we agree on everything. Still, we can find a place of agreement and understanding in the wisdom of Scripture, which is higher than our opinionated differences and preferences. It is much higher realm than that of the fleshly agreement. By God's divine design, men and women were created to complete and complement one another. Couples will naturally compare, complain, and compete without the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding from the Spirit of God. In doing so, we ignorantly open the door to division, discord, and divorce. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. And that's exactly what that tr triangle that I showed you was. It's a threefold cord. It's you, your spouse, and Christ. That's a threefold cord, and it cannot be easily broken unless we invite the enemy in to break it. In the Amplified Classic Edition, don't ask me what that is, but I like the wording, Matthew 18, 18 through 20 says, Again, I tell you, if two of you on earth agree, and this is what it means, harmonize together, make a symphony together about whatever, anything and everything they ask, it will come to pass and be done by my Father in heaven. There is a stipulation to that. There are some things we can ask for together in agreement, but God is not obligated to answer it if it's out of the will of God. And so there are times in my life where I've prayed for things, and thank God I didn't get them. That's all I can say. And I believed with my, my whole heart that I was going to, and I didn't. And at first you're disappointed, but then later you realize, Abba is good, and he knows best. As that old show used to say, Father knows best. Amen. There's a story in the Bible for those of you about unequally yoked marriages and how to live a life of honor to God in the midst of it. I invite you to study out 1 Samuel 25. It's a story about Abigail and Nabal. And it's a, a beautiful story how this man who was unwilling to honor the king put his whole family in jeopardy to be annihilated. But because Abigail, a wise woman, not just a woman of intercession, but a wise woman of action, decided to do the right thing in the situation, and she saved her entire household. So women, just remember, men are the head, but you're the neck. We have influence. Use your influence for good and not for harm, and God will bless you. Use your influence to manipulate and control, and you sabotage the blessing of the Lord in your marriage. Men need our encouragement, they need words of affirmation just like you do, and yeah, they're big, and yeah, they're tough, and yeah, they're strong, but they have a heart that needs to be ministered to, and if you're a wise wife, you will minister to your husband's heart with wisdom and knowledge from God. I've met many women like Abigail whose husbands did not honor the king and lead their families with God's wisdom which is a hardship for the women and children. I've also seen men make every effort to lead their families, but their wives are critical and unwilling to trust their leadership. Families can survive without husband and wife spiritually working together, but families, especially the children, thrive when they do. Although married, spiritually single men and women have a challenging life. They desire for their spouse to be actively involved in serving God with them. Many spouses live with years of disappointment and discouragement. No matter how much they pray or what they do, there's no apparent evidence of change. The meaning of Abigail's name is father of the dance of joy. Whatever situation you're in, learn to rejoice in the Lord and dance before God with joy. Because you don't have to come under the oppression and the heaviness of what someone else's life um, is bringing to the table or to the marriage. The Bible describes her as a sensible, intelligent, and beautiful woman. I encourage those who live disappointed to press into the joy of the Lord regardless of their spouse's decisions. So, 
so we talked about in the marriage. So this synergy, this um, unity, this oneness, and this harmony. But in the ministry, Luke chapter 10, verse 1 through 2, it says, After these things, the Lord appointed 70 elders also and sent them out two by two before his face into every city and place he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, the, tru the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. In the ministry, having two people that work together, walk together, worship together, war together, is exemplified in the beautiful marriage of Pastor Dave and Pastor Donna Hanshimaker. What can God do with a husband and wife couple? I watch what God does with my daughter Bethany and her husband Daryl. They pastor Hilltop Church in Boston. Man, I see what God does with them. I watch what God does with uh, Michelle uh, and, and Zenzo Matoga. I had Michelle when I was a youth pastor back in the day, and she was in our youth ministry. She was one of our student missionaries that we sent out to Haverhill High School. And I'll tell you what, I watch what God does with these amazing couples, not because they're anything supernaturally different than you. It's because they work together. They worship together. They war together. They, they do it together. There is such synergy that happens in ministry. And so women like myself, whose husband is not in ministry with them, gives me apostolic covering and gives me a beautiful ministry gifts to work with me because the vision that God gave for this church could never have happened without them. I couldn't do it on my own. God gave me the vision. I carried the seed in intercession, but it took them to bring it to pass. And so together, we have this synergy, this beautiful harmony, this working together in peace and joy with Pastor Dave, Pastor Donner, and the staff here at Renaissance. It makes what we do so beautiful and so amazing, and I'm so grateful for it. In the marketplace, a network of professionals and leaders in the marketplace who make an impact on society. I'll tell you this one story about this beautiful couple. Their name is Julio and Nil Binda. They have a jujitsu place right here in Bradford. And I'll tell you, I've known this couple, I've lost count. I don't know, I want to say 15 years. And she, her heart was so broken because she so wanted to be involved in ministry. She had young children and her husband was starting a business. And she was like, Pastor, I want to be in church and do these things, but my husband feels called to this, the marketplace, and I'm in conflict. And I said, Sister, you want to see God move in your life? Support what he's doing. God will bless you if you will support and be involved with what he's doing and be a strength to him. And I'll tell you, this couple is an amazing example to the world in the marketplace. And I commend them for what they have done. And you know, they got counsel that he's out of the will of God and you shouldn't do this and saying things to her and all this kind of stuff. And it brought confusion in her heart. And I said, my sister in Christ... This is the call of God on your husband and on you people's lives. And I support you wholeheartedly. And I'll tell you what, when they opened their business, they came and asked me to bless it because they felt the, the strength that came from a spiritual mama that saw the gift of God. And I'll tell you, he ministers to so many men and is an example to men in the marketplace, and I'm so proud of both of them. In the military, there was Deborah and Barak, Judges 4, look it up, read the story. Military commander and a woman prophet and judge of Israel. The kingdom relationship to save a nation, Israel. It's amazing. Barak was a military commander and a mighty warrior in the Lord's army whose name means lightning. God raised Deborah and Barak to end the 20-year oppression of Israel by the Canaanites. Just lost my whole page, praise the Lord. <laughs> I have no idea where it went. Come back in the name. Here we go. Hallelujah. I know. Don't you love it? Anyway, so that was a quote I was reading from my book, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that. But anyway, these are the chap some of the chapters that I've written on. Uh, so anyway, let me get back to where I was, if I can. All right. When we are in one accord, there is harmony, peace, and joy. In the Old Testament, one accord is always used to describe unanimous participation in a particular action conveying the inner unity, oneness of heart and mind of a group of people engaged in similar action. It's amazing what God will do. You know, um, through the deliverance ministry of He Cares for Me, uh, here in this church, the ministry is called Free Indeed. We've ministered to hundreds of men and women who have suffered pain and injustice from one or both parents. On many occasions, those who married before knowing Christ, as I already mentioned, picked a mate with similar brokenness in their life. 
And as a result, they have a lot of hurt and de debilitating disappointment. Um, and I find, and I'm not saying that I know it all, I don't, I know a little bit, but I know this, having lived on the earth over 70 years and having been in ministry 46 years, I can't think of a single person that struggled with adultery in their heart, not necessarily fulfilling it, struggled with pornography, and that includes women, struggled with um, same-sex attraction, and that includes Christians, struggled with their sexual identity that had not had some kind of an abuse in their life from a male or a female role model, where they have been broken. And I know that from my own life, growing up as a kid, because I saw my mom as a dominating, controlling, uh, angry woman, and I saw my father as a passive, negligent, um, absent father. He worked hard, he provided for us, but he wasn't engaged. He didn't dare ruffle mom's feathers, especially when mom was drinking. But I knew growing up as a kid, I didn't want to be a female because I didn't want to be like my mom. I didn't want to be a man. I didn't want to be a man. I didn't want to be like my dad. I wanted to be non-binary. See how it happens? When you're a child, there are seeds planted in you where you say, you know what? I just want to be a them. I don't want to be either because I don't like what I see in either one. Now, my relationship with my mom and dad has been healed. I led them both to Christ. I have nothing in my heart toward them. I'm not angry. I'm not bitter. I'm not any of those things. See, Christians identify the brokenness in their past, not to blame the people in their past, but to identify brokenness so that they can release the people from their past and bless them and let go of that bitterness and that anger and that resentment so they can be healed. Without it, you are not healed. You walk around broken. Without accepting the sacrifice of atonement of Jesus Christ on the, blood, the, of, on the cross, his blood, we will live under the curse. We will hide from God, covering our shame and blaming others. We still see the consequences of Adam's sin played out today. Since the beginning of time, men and women have had an ongoing power struggle, resisting God's divine design for harmony between us. In the New Living Translation, I want to read you this. In Genesis, it says, you will desire the control of your husband, but he will rule over you. Today, we still see this fight for control and dominance in male and female relationships. God doesn't condone this arrangement. It was never part of his plan for us. This is the consequence of sinful disobedience. It plays out in marriage statistics, the gay lesbian lifestyle, and abortion issue. Men and women of God, it's time now for us to worship walk, work, and war together in Jesus. He came to restore all things, including godly relationships. To advance the kingdom of God, we can no longer permit the enemy to perpetrate, to penetrate, to bring discord and enmity and offense in our marriage and in the ministry. We must discern his lies and be counteractive to his schemes. You've got to be on your game. You've got to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. You've got to know what manner of spirit that is working against you. And you've got to deal in the spiritual realm with it. You may not be able to confront it in the natural realm with somebody, but you can certainly deal with it in the spiritual realm. And if you don't start there first, you'll never be able to confront it in the natural realm. We have got to get beyond where we've been. We're not a witness to the world in our marriages and in our ministry. So many people are broken because they come from churches that don't understand the spiritual dynamics of what's at work in a church. The seeds that are sown, if we don't pull them up and uproot them, and if we don't curse those seeds that have been sown and then speak blessing and speak life, we end up having the results and the consequences in our church body because we're not dealing with things spiritually. That ain't happening here. In Jesus' name. We walk in a spiritual understanding in our marriages, in the marketplace, in the ministry, and in the, in the military, because we are called to be the army of the Lord. And Father, I just thank you, Lord God, for the word of the Lord. You are restoring individuals in their identity and who they are in Christ. You're restoring marriages and relationships. You're restoring ministry to be a representation of the Heavenly Father's blueprint and design for the church. You're restoring, God, our impact in the marketplace. 
You're restoring us, God, as men and women of faith in the military, as men and women who understand spiritual authority, and we're not afraid to use our authority to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Father, I thank you that you've given us all power and authority to decree and declare a thing according to your word, and it shall be. So, Father, I claim that everybody listening to this message today will have a wake-up call from the Holy Spirit and say, it's time for me to rise up and to declare my inheritance as a child of God. And I'm not going to sit back any longer. I'm not going to let the devil take over my marriage or my kids. I'm not going to let the enemy infiltrate in our ministry. I'm not going to let the enemy rob me of my calling and my anointing for the marketplace. But I'm going to stand. And I'm going to stand strong in the name of the Lord and in the power of his might. And I'm going to see God move mountains. And I'm going to feel the presence of the Lord as I declare his name over this situation and the power that comes from the Holy Spirit. And I thank you, Lord God, that you're going to do great and awesome things. And I speak grace to every mountain, every insurpassable mountain that people said it's impossible. It might be impossible for you, but it's not impossible for God. It's time for us to join our faith together in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Pastor Dave. Thank you, Jesus. Here's how I think we need to close today. I would like every father and every single man to come up. I want to pray a prayer of blessing over every father, every young man who eventually will be a father. Amen? Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. For those of you that are going to stay seated, I just want you to extend a hand. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He is good. Hirabasa lelela.